Okay, this is a one speaker meeting. Please welcome our speaker tonight, Ed. Hey! All right, Ed. I'm Ed, alcoholic addict. Yeah. And uh, I'm very grateful to be here today. Thank you, Michelle, for asking me to speak. Thank you, Mickey Bush, for saying hi. I haven't seen you in a while. David, for always being here. Lots of people uh, that I've seen before. Some of you see? Yeah. We're saving energy. It's part of a green yeah. program that I'm initiating. It's part of an initiate. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I, wherever I go, people are trying to save energy. It's a very important part of my life. I have that effect on people. Oh, God, it's good to be here. Let me tell you something. God willing, one day at a time, December 21st, really just a month from now, uh, I will, uh, again, if I do it one day at a time, I will have 30 years December 21st. Miracle, miracle. 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 And, uh, and I was a real alcoholic, a quart of vodka a day, uh, lots of quaaludes, lots of coke, lots of pills. Didn't care if it was up or down, handful of pills, just, don't you want to know what it is? Somebody say, no, I just want to get out of here. I, <laughs> I don't care if it's up or down, just get me out of here. And that's the way it was. And to see the chips was exciting again tonight and happy birthday, Ellery. And, uh, and uh, was it Ellery? Did I get the name right? Yeah. Ellery, happy birthday. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, the chips, uh, particularly exciting because it took me two years to get a 30-day chip. I just kept coming in to meetings, and I'd have 21 days, 25 days, and I'd keep going back out because I, I just hadn't had enough, I guess, and somehow made it back in alive. And that is a miracle. Uh, I will talk about my uh, quart of vodka a day drinking and all of that. I will qualify as an alcoholic. But before I do that, I want to tell you what it's like today. It is beyond anything I ever dreamt of. And I don't mean in, material, in a material sense. I have some material things, but I'm not talking about that. I'm really not. Um, I have a level of serenity now that I never, never counted on. I never thought I'd get that in this room. I never thought I'd get that. I just wanted to get out of the hell. I wanted to get out of the pain. That's why I took the drugs and alcohol. But I wanted to get out of that further pain of uh, drug and alcohol addiction. So I came in here just to have a little foxhole to crawl into and shelter from the storm and maybe a piece of wood to put over my head to keep wind from blowing in the cold rain of alcoholism and drug addiction. And, and now I live in a grand manner. And again, I don't mean uh, money, property, and prestige. I mean, I live in a way, this morning I rode my bike a considerable distance for a 60-year-old ancient person. <laughs> And, uh, and that felt really good. I got high on those endorphins, which is a legal drug apparently. <laughs> high on just working out and what your body produces. I got especially high taking my 10-year-old daughter to school this morning. I get pretty high from my two grandkids and my two grown kids, 31 and 32. And uh, I'm blessed. I am blessed beyond anything I ever wanted. I didn't ever count on this. I just thought if I can get the pain to reduce by 50%, I will be happy. And that's all I wanted. And, and then this happened after years. After I got some relief right away uh, from the pain of alcoholism because I quit really in my 20s. Uh, and so I felt good right away. But that was my undoing, too, in a way. For the first two years I kept coming in here, I'd feel good. 72 hours after having had the full-blown DTs because I was 20-something and I was this insane dichotomy of a human being drug and alcohol addicted person who would leave in the middle of a bender where are you going the guys would say at some bar down at Santa Monica Western where the hell are you going it's three o'clock I'll be right back my brother I got to go work out have some brown rice and vegetables okay catch you later <laughs> catch you later and I would <laughs> go work out drunk as a skunk take a sweat and do the whole thing and then eat brown rice and vegetables and maybe that you know it almost killed me because I felt so good you know uh, just a short time after having had the DTs for the ninth time 
but maybe it saved me too because the other people in the bar at Santa Monica Western were living for days or weeks on, you know, a pickled egg and a Slim Jim and barbecue chips. <laughs> so uh, uh, it was great. I mean, how the people, for instance, at the Old World restaurant I used to go to in the morning to get my fix, to, you know, I would go there to the Old World and I would, to get my health food fix, I would sit there at the Old World on Sunset Boulevard, you know, whenever, the, I think they open at 8 in the morning for breakfast, I'd go there, hi, uh, good morning, I see you have the Belgian waffle, I would like to have a Belgian waffle, please, is that, that's with the whole wheat, correct? Excellent. And it's with the, uh, the Altadena raw milk, is it not? Thank you so much. I'm very hungry, I think I'll have an omelet too. Are those the Shelton's eggs, the uh, fertile eggs? Excellent. I'll have some of that too. And uh, yeah, raw milk again with that, of course. And uh, uh, come back one second. And also bring me a couple of Bloody Marys while you're at it too. <laughs> that, hold on. Make it just keep them coming. It'd be kind of like an air traffic controller when one is picking up like this, taking off. Have another one landing. I'm picking one up. Another one is landing. Safely. I'm picking up and you can safely land another. And that's the way it was, how they kept from, you know, just laughing in front of me, I don't know. And uh, that's the way I did it. I uh, drank a quart of vodka a day. And you hear these grand things, you know, that uh, to be totally clear, rigorous honesty, we must have that at this podium, must be the entire truth. Uh, I drank a quart of vodka 300 days a year. 300 days a year, I drank a quart of vodka. The other 60 some odd days a year, I drank half a quart, or I drank three quarters of a quart, or I drank, you know, two or three six packs. And that's the way I did it from 1971 through 1978. And I finally discovered that I, <laughs> finally discovered, I had this problem because I was driving drunk. And I was faced with this decision at some point, this lawyer I had been to before to try to get me out of a bind because I kept running into people drunk which apparently is illegal. <laughs> drunk and with no insurance, just totaling cars, you know? Drunk, no insurance, running in. I had went to this lawyer, what am I gonna do? I'll tell you what you're gonna do if I'm gonna help you at all. You are gonna, you will no longer drink and drive. I want you to promise me now, and I know your friends, I'm gonna check up on this. You, you have to promise me right now before I take this case, you will no longer drink and drive. I said, I, I promise 100%, you can verify it. <laughs> Tony, take my car. I'm going to give the car away. It never occurred to me to stop drinking. I figured I'd stop driving. <laughs> I never really you can't drink and drive. Drink it. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a no-brainer. I just won't drive. And uh, and that's what it was. And then I really that was '74 when I made that decision. I think '74 or '5 doesn't matter. But I went, wow, this is really great now because there's none of that, you know risk factor, you know, I'm not going to be running any more cars. Now I can really, and I moved to a place near Santa Monica and Western. I had a, a loft there for 75 bucks a month. Even in 1974 when I moved in this place, 75 a month was pretty good rent. You could get drunk and eat and pay your rent and the modest utilities, uh, you know, on unemployment. I didn't even need to work. If I worked, that was gravy. Then I had money for Coke or Quaaludes. <laughs> but I could, for 75 a month rent, I had it all figured out. There were some bars there. The other half of the equation, there was a bar, might still be there, I don't know, near Santa Monica Western called The Host. They open at 6 a.m. And there's some pretty serious practitioners came in at 6 a.m. to this bar. <laughs> Some kind of normal folks, a cab driver coming off, just one little belt before he went home and went to sleep, but some serious people, literally with the thing. I saw a guy do the thing with a tight little scarf around his wrist, and he literally pulled a drink up like this. <laughs> I mean, just couldn't get it, you know. Maybe it was some actor trying out for a part, I don't know, but it, I bought it, it looked pretty real to me. And then the black light, I went in there. I remember, I knew I found the right bar. I went in there by accident one day, and I said, um, how much is a, a vodka, double vodka tonic tall glass with a lime? That's like 80 cents or something, or 70. Again, this was 1974, but it was still a good price for a well drink. 
And it was not like a stingy, it wasn't all water. This was, you know, vodka and tonic. And uh, I went, you know what, I'm going to buy a, I want to buy a round for the bar. It was maybe, you know, six people in there. <laughs> but I want to buy a round for the bar. I gave them $10. I got change back, you know. I went, this is, I found heaven here. I got it all figured out now. But that was still like 74, 75, and I, had, um, I hadn't had the DTs yet, so that was yet to come. I literally thought I could act with impunity. I literally thought I could act with impunity. There was a guy, you might remember Alice Cooper. Uh, Alice, uh, I, I met him, nice enough guy, and uh, I said, man, I got a really cool, I'm starting to really feel bad in the morning. He said, oh, 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 I got the solution to that. I drink uh, seven and seven, Seagram's seven and seven up, or Seagram's and Coke, and that because the blood sugar, he had something about the blood sugar, he told me, he said, here's the thing, you can't, the problem that you're having, do you ever like stop drinking at some point? Yeah. Oh no, that's your problem, don't stop. You can't, it's like a treadmill, you can't just stop, you're gonna run up against the machine or the wall or something, you have to. Don't ever, just keep making, have them right away in the morning. Then I started drinking right away in the morning and, and that worked for a while, because again, I'm like at 24 or something, and uh, 24, 25 now, and um, it worked for a while until that horrible day of reckoning. Anybody else have the DTs, by the way? Yeah, those are fun, that's fun. And I don't know what they are for the other people that raised their hand, but for me it wasn't, there were no snakes coming out of the wall, there were no pink elephants certainly, it wasn't that stereotypical stuff, but it was literally it was this uh, hotel room in, in Marysville, the first time I had them, I had them about four times before I finally got sober this time. And, um, and it was just like having nightmares while you're awake. It was just like horrible nightmares. I'd just be, close my eyes, and suddenly there'd be a guy hanging from a noose right in front of me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And it was quite, quite real. Close my eyes again, my heart's pounding because it was not a pretty image. And there'd be a, suddenly a vampire guy about to bite into my neck. And it went on all night and I couldn't sleep. And I had to sleep because I had to work the next day. And, um, and it, was, it was not good. And, I, and this is the miracle of... Uh, this program or something or having angels watching over us. I don't know what it is, but I, I did, I had the DTs and it was so bad I thought I was gonna die. I of course did not die. And I, uh, I got through a day's work somehow. I had to work like at seven in the morning the next day. And got through a day's work, did that up in Marysville, California. Did the work, came home and my, you know, get the Allen on ambulance wife was there. You're kind of, uh, honey, help me. Do you have any quaaludes left? No, I don't have anything. Do you have any? No, no, no. no all I got, there's some liquor. Do you want to have? No, no. I, I literally was, I was so sick. This was unheard of the first time it ever happened. I literally couldn't take the, you know, Alice cure of just having another drink. I couldn't think about having a drink of anything. There was some liquor. I couldn't take that. There was no value, no nothing. I couldn't. So I just went and took a hot bath. I went, let me just turn on the TV and see if there's anything there that make me feel better. <laughs> and I turned on the TV just to see, you know, not hoping to be entertained out of it. I didn't want a variety show. I wasn't expecting the Sunny and Cher Good Time Hour, but I just, I, I, I turned it on just to see normal people doing normal things, you know, that it kind of, that the world was normal. I go to turn on the TV and there's nothing. There's absolutely, it's just like black nothing. But it's not like, is it the, yeah, it's, I'm on a real channel that I've seen before in this hotel room TV. And I went to change it just as I change it. Oh, the reason it was black and there's nothing, the opening credits were starting on a show. And it says, David Wolper presents Dick Van Dyke in The Morning After. <laughs> and it was one of those God shot kinds of things. I went, whoa, let me, maybe I need to see this. And I watched this thing and it was about us. It was about alcoholics. It was a 70s kind of a TV movie. This was 1976. So they made it in 75 or whenever they made it. And it was, uh, but it was very well done. David Wolper was a good producer and it was a well done show, well directed, well written. Everything was pretty real. If I saw it again today, uh, it might seem dated, but it seemed very good then. And it was 
amazing to me, amazing that there are other people out there like that as depicted in this thing, other alcoholics going through exactly the same thing that I was going through. It was literally, I was gobsmacked, amazed that that was the case, which is unusual for me because I have a father, Ed Begley Sr., who died sober in this program, 18 years sober. So, you know, he, he, he had this program. I remember listening through the, the wall or a door or something at the old wagon wheel uh, AA meeting in Oxnard. There was a place out there, the wagon wheel kind of, and I was listening through the door and there's all this laughter. So I knew somehow that there was this thing, this AA thing, knew it. I forgot the best part. I had in my wallet, I had a little wallet. I had in the back taped like back here where I didn't see it all the time, but once in a while when I cleaned out the wallet, I taped there a little clipping from the uh, Hollywood Reporter, the Daily Variety. It was a little thing this big. It was just a little slug from the thing that I cut out. You know what it was? Alcoholics Anonymous, 213-385-2600, whatever it was back in 1972 when I put it in my wallet. Why did I put that there? <laughs> you know, talk about knowing where you're headed. I put it there because in case of fire, break glass, you know. <laughs> I put it there because I somehow knew in my conscious or subconscious where I was headed and, uh, and had it there. And then I, I called that number up, having seen this thing with Dick Van Dyke. And, uh, and I made a call to a guy that I knew that was sober. And he said, well, you should go to a meeting here. And I went to a meeting uh, at uh, like 4th and Wilshire there, that St. Augustine's meeting that's downstairs. Went there and again was gobsmacked yet again, just shocked beyond description, because I walked in the room, it was basically, it looked like this, in 1976 this was now, my first meeting, October of 76, I walked in, it was people, I literally expected, you know, my dad kind of people to be there, you know, it was like 60 something, and a bunch of people in trench coats, you know, with a, a short dog or a bottle of toque, you know, waiting outside, and it, the room kind of looked like this, it, you know, and it was like amazing to me that there were these and people were laughing. And this guy, Norm A., Norm Alpert, spoke. Remember Norm? And he was great. He was, had a good program, and he was funny. That kept me coming back. And he uh, <coughs> dressed up in a suit, and he, had, he <coughs> told a version of my story. I was just shocked. But not so shocked I could make 30 days after that. <laughs> I was not so shocked it really sunk in because again I've heard it said and I think it's true you know you're coming in here do you have any money left do you have any family left do you have any looks left Ooh, it's gonna be hard for you then <laughs> sorry good luck because I was 76 I just turned 27 it's late 76 I just turned 27 and I came in and like again you know uh, as other times I got sober, 72 hours after having had the full-blown DTs, vampires, guys and nooses, the whole thing, feeling like I'm going to die, hot bath, Dick Van Dyke, the whole thing, I felt, 72 hours later, I felt just great. <laughs> Literally felt really as good as I've ever felt. And I went, okay, okay, I'm going okay, to do this thing for 30 days, but, you know, after that, I think I'm just going to, a little wine with dinner and I'll be fine. <laughs> And literally believe that. Literally, and then we'd get through, no, honey, I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking. I wouldn't drink for 21 days, 25 days, and just have a little wine for, with dinner. Sure enough, honey, see? A little wine with dinner. That's all I'm having. And that's it. And we'd do it the first night. We'd have just one glass of wine for dinner the first night. <laughs> night two, my wife would be a little alarmed because open a bottle of wine, you know, have half a bottle of wine. Okay, I had a few glasses tonight, I understand, but it's just, it's a celebration to show. See, night one, one glass, night two, half a bottle, admittedly a little bit more, but that's, and then night three, just full, you know, quart of vodka, score some blow, let's go. Yeah. And yeah, that's the way it was. How I didn't kill anybody, the miracle, the miracle of my good fortune, I don't know how I didn't kill anybody. I drove drunk nearly every night until I gave my car away from 1971 through 
I only gave it away for about a year. Then I went, oh, screw it. I'm going to drive again in 77, 76, whatever. At some point in there, I started driving again. But I didn't drive for a year. But I drove drunk every night and ran into people a lot. <laughs> no insurance. No, and this was the 70s. You could get away with murder practically. It was insane. I remember Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve, 1975, you want to get in the Christmas spirit. You don't want to just be sitting at home. You want to get out there and go to a place that's really in the Christmas spirit. So I went to the Troubadour. <laughs> right, Mickey? Yeah. He wasn't there that night, but other friends were. And um, so I had my requisite quart of vodka. My drinking buddy, Neil, was with me. And so we're there at the, at the Troubadour, and we think, this is not really... Let's be honest, it's Christmas Eve. I don't know that this is the right place to be celebrating a sacred season, the birth of Christ. We need to go to the rainbow. <laughs> so we leave Tana's and head for the bow. And I go up there, and I had my requisite quart of vodka. So I go, you know what, Neil, I can't. I, you know, I got to get us home later, so I'm not going to do any more vodka. Let's just get a bottle of Chardonnay and we'll be fine. And, which mixes real well with vodka, of course. So I'm starting to drink some Chardonnay, and a friend comes up, a musician comes up. Hey, man, Merry Christmas. He's got his hand open, you know. Oh, my God, are those lewds? So he's got about six or seven quaaludes there. Uh, he, he says, yeah, man, Merry Christmas. Go ahead, have some. I said, buddy, I just had a... A quart of vodka. I've had like most of this bottle of Chardonnay. You got to keep up, Neil. Come on, drink your share. There's no way I'm going to take a Quaalude, even though it's Christmas Eve. But thank you. Give me half. So I take half a Quaalude. Five minutes later, you know what? Give me another half. Give me another half. So now I'm quart of vodka, most of a bottle of Chardonnay. Lude and a half, and I'm starting to get a little toasty. <laughs> and I say to Neil, I said, Neil, I really can't drive us home. I can't, I can't get us home. And he goes, I have a high He literally can't, he can't even talk. Okay. I'm going to get us home. I'm going to get us home. Let's just take it real slow and easy. Let's get the car slowly and carefully. Hold on to the banister and let's get to the car carefully and slowly. And then I realized, I said, you know, we're going to have a bad hangover tomorrow from all this. The vodka and the Chardonnay are not going to mix well. We're going to have to stop at Greenblatt's, I think, and get something for the morning. Or maybe tonight, you know. So we're going we're gonna to stop and get something. So, um, okay, let's go. And I pull out of the rainbow, and I'm talking to my friend Neil, who's in the passenger side. I said, look, you go in to, because it's nearly two, you go in there. I'll, you know, I'll come up and honk to the thing, because we know that Fred's there, and you run right in, because otherwise they can't serve us after two. And my friend Neil gets this weird look on. I said, what's the, do you, are you, like, mad at Fred, or what's the matter with you? Why are you looking so weird? He goes... <laughs> What? Oh, the road. Boom! <laughs> crash, 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 crash. Just cars sliding along the side of one car. Just totally like welding the passenger side doors together as one. Just damaging. You can't open them. They couldn't. They had to get out the other side or out the window. And then, you know, this is, and this car is like a, 67 olds with four very large gentlemen from the inner city who were less than thrilled with me at this point. <laughs> and then shoot through the intersection, and somehow it didn't explode. If it had been a Pinto, there'd be a whole different story I'm telling now. Knock this Honda Civic through the intersection, and it just parts everywhere. The starter's over here, what have you. I'm thinking, please, dear God, let this guy be alive. Please let him be alive. Let him be alive. I know he's going to be injured, but please let him be alive. Oh, my God, I've killed somebody. The door slowly opens, and I'm waiting to see if the guy can even move to get out. But a leg does not get out. A leg, a leg comes out in a cast with a crutch. He's injured already from the skiing. 
he comes out, he's got to, maybe that saved that leg the way I hit the thing. Because he'd already had a cast on. And then to the right, then I, and adrenaline is a powerful drug, my friends. Because I'm on the vodka, yes, I'm on the Chardonnay, yes, I'm on the Quaaludes, but that amount of adrenaline in your 20s can do miraculous things. So I say to the four guys, I'm going to make good in all this damage, and I did, because that was doable. The guy with the Honda Civic, I'm going to talk to you in a second, sir. I'm so sorry about your car. Gentlemen, do me a favor. Who am I talking to? Two on the right, I didn't mention. Two Sheriff's Department guys are sitting right there. Two... Los Angeles Sheriff, because this is before there was a West Hollywood, this is 75, there's no separate city, this is LA County territory, and the LA Sheriff's Department had dominion over that. These Sheriff's Department guys are there going, you have a permit to film this? They literally like, where are the cameras? Gentlemen, I'm going to take care of everything. One second, guys, do me one favor and one only. It's Christmas Eve, this is all I ask. Cuff me and take me in. What? Cuff me and take me in. Have you been drinking? I'm not going to lie to you. I've had one drink. It's Christmas Eve. And I'm talking kind of in this voice. There's so much adrenaline. I'm talking literally almost like this. I say, guys, cuff me and take me in. I've been trying to get this, the brakes fixed on this car since uh, four weeks ago. I'm going to have a lawsuit, and you will help me by cuffing me and take me in. You will help my case. I beg of you. They let me get in the car and drive it home. They let me get in the car and drive. I let me get in the car. I had them under the car. I was under the car. Then I was in the thing, pulling up the parking brake. Does the parking brake work? Yeah, is, is there any brake fluid under there? The brakes were totally fine. There's nothing wrong with the brakes. I just slammed into cars because I was drunk. They let me get in the car and go home. It was a different age. They, of course, wouldn't do that today. Not only that, the guy with the crutch and the, uh, and the, the cast, he got in the car with me. <laughs> I see him going to a pay phone. There's no cell phones back then. He's going to call a cab. No, I hang it up. I will not have it, sir. I will not have you spending money in a cab. I will take you home. Okay. The sweet guy, he gets in the car with me, but by then the tops are gone. They filled out the thing. I've given the address to the four guys with the 67 Olds, and his car is being towed away because it's total, the Honda Civic. I said, I'm going to give you a ride home, but by then and now I'm kind of back to the Quaaludes and the Chardonnay and the thing. And we don't get, I get in the car, my car is drivable. I get in the car and I start to drive. I don't make it to Sunset Plaza. I don't make it to where La Dome used to be, to the curve there, before I'm like literally sliding, I'm scraping alongside cars. I'm hitting them as I'm driving. And at this point, he's like, he takes his crutch, he's hitting me. Let me out of the car. You fucked up. Let me out! Fine, fine. Get out and walk then, ingrate! You try to help a guy. Neil, can you believe this guy? Is it too late for Greenblatt's? And that's the way it was. That's the way it was, and did that uh, again and again. And finally, that lawyer, after that one, I think, is when he said, you can no longer drink and drive, and I found my solution. Gave the car away for over a year. Didn't drive at all for a year. Just got really drunk and, and you know, hitchhiked and took the bus and rode a bike or whatever the hell I could do. And uh, somehow did it all. Uh, and, and then had the DTs. And here's the thing, and I, got, I can't stress this enough for the new people. I had finally bottomed out. Have, after having had the DTs for the third time, I wound up at Cedar sinai I really hit my bottom September 30th of 1978. But if you did the math when I said my 30 years, that doesn't, that would have been last year I'd have my 30th. That is not my sobriety date. I bottomed out in 78, went to Cedar sinai almost died. They gave me some Epicac to get out some of the pills I'd taken. Not a suicide attempt, I just kept taking them to make the DTs go away. I'd had the DTs again for the third or fourth time, and I just couldn't take the pain, so I, was ta I called up my doctor to get some Valium. That's what I took to, you know, keep the pain away for these hangovers. And the regular doctor wasn't there. This other doctor was there, the backup dude, and he goes, oh, uh, Valium, I don't know that that's good. That's a muscle relaxant. Relax you shouldn't take that with alcohol. Well, what can you give me? I'll give you some Thorazine. <laughs> 
Maybe he wanted me dead, I don't know. And they're very different than Valium. Valium is a muscle relaxant, Thorazine is a totally different drug, and I took one, it didn't have any effect. I took a second, took a third. I took about eight or nine of them, 25 milligram. Uh, took eight or nine, and then finally went out. And then woke up with my wife slapping me, and not for the usual reasons. Um, <laughs> she slapped me saying, you gotta wake up, you gotta wake up, you gotta walk around. Drink some coffee, you gotta, we gotta, something's wrong, something's wrong, your breathing's bad, your color's bad. You're something, you've got, your pulse is real low. And I kind of took the pulse. Yeah, you might be right, hold on. Yeah, it's really, okay, maybe. And I had trouble breathing, not anxiety attack, trouble breathing. I was a, probably about to die. Because if you send enough chemical signals to your brain with alcohol and drugs, that much thorazine mixed with alcohol, at some point your brain, like Jim Morrison's brain and <coughs> Janis Joplin's brain or Jim, uh, John Belushi's, you know, at some point, your brain will get the message and say, oh, I didn't understand you. You want me to shut everything down. The motor nerves that run your breathing and your heart and all that stuff, it will do that for you if you instruct it enough chemically. And that's what was happening. But somehow, somebody got me to Cedars, got me to Cedars in time, gave me some Epicac, came up with as much of the stuff, and they had me an IV or something, and I pulled through. And I bring that up because from that nadir, that bottom, that Zabriskie point, that very low, low point in my life, I went, I'm done. I am done. My little one-year-old daughter at that point, trying to get to her, her father, and she couldn't get to me. She couldn't hold me because I had these cords in the way, IVs and stuff, and a nasal cannula. And I thought, this image of my daughter can't hold her father, my one-year-old, because I got too many cords in me. This is as low as it gets. I'm going to go to those meetings again. I'm going to make it work. And I did just that. I went to a meeting a day from September 30th, 1978, a meeting a day for a year and several months, and then drank again. And why did I drink again? I'll tell you exactly why. There's no confusion about it. I did not have a sponsor, and I did not work the steps. I didn't do an inventory. I, didn't, I wasn't working the steps. I didn't get a sponsor. Why? I was just too busy. I was just, yeah, that's, I understand, at some point I'm going to do that, and I know that's right for you and you, but I'm, you don't understand my schedule, man. I've got a, some very important jobs coming up. You know, I just can't, I want to do it. Yes, I'm sure it's very important, but I just can't. i got a whole different, uh, you know, set of needs here. Sit down right there, buddy. We've got a seat for you. And, and so uh, I, I thought I was special, and it almost killed me. I thought I was unique and special and that the rules didn't apply to me. So I drank again for three of the most candy-ass days of drinking I've ever had in my life. I drank night one, half a bottle of wine. Not a lot, is it? Half a bottle of wine, not half a case the way I'm used to drinking. I drank a case of wine with a friend, my friend Nelson Lyon and I. Get him up here, he'll tell you, yeah, we drank a case of wine together. I didn't drink more or less than him, we drank a case. Many other people have done that here, I'm sure. Uh, drank a case of wine, now a half a bottle of wine, and not just hung over and sick the next day, sick that night. Sick that night, kind of in the middle of the drunk. What's that about? The wine is poisoned. I literally thought there's something wrong with the wine. Next night, I try uh, Henry Weinhardt's Private Reserve. I knew that was the deal. There was something poison in the wine I chose to drink. Somebody put something toxic in there, but if I drank this organic, this was the first of these microbreweries, this is 1978 or something, and so organic beer, that's the deal. I'll just drink that and just have, I had three or four of those, three, I had three of those night one, sick as a dog that night, and finally the last night, the third night of this candy ass drinking, December 21st, 1979, which is my sobriety date now, I drank four beers, Kirin or some other good beer, some good Japanese beer, night three, and I was literally like sick and kind of, once I could drink five, six packs, what's wrong here? We have a progressive disease, folks. It keeps working, it's doing push-ups out in that parking lot right now, while we're in here thinking we're all cured. And I, and I, I figured, okay, I got to get back to the meetings, what have you. I just got to sneak in the house because I can't have my wife see me. And I was drunk as a skunk on four beers, and I probably smelled of it. And I was trying to get in the shower to shower the smell of beer off. And she's back 
where the first group of people are standing back there. She's that distance away. She's that far away. And I'm trying to get to the bathroom that's over there. Hi, honey. Yeah, I just got to go jump in the shower because I went to the gym. And I'm trying to get that way. And she's back there with a plate of food. Hi, I made you a special dish. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You're drinking. From that distance, believe me, she couldn't smell me from that distance. How did she know I was drinking? I asked her, I said, how did you know I was drinking? She said, you look completely different. I said, what do you mean I look completely different? What did I look like? She said, you know that, you know that ride at Disneyland, Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah. The guy's trying to get the keys from the dog. You look just like one of them. And I, I looked in the mirror, I did. I did, I looked, oh, come here. Give me those keys. And uh, so then I dove in, and I'll finish up now because I know we got to wrap it up, but I, I dove back in not because I wanted to because this guy, Bobby Newarth, uh, Bobby N, uh, I had been booked before because, again, I had a year and a month and nobody knew I had gone out in these few days. I had been scheduled to speak in Malibu and this night upcoming, right like the next day after this slip, I called up Bobby and said, oh, Bobby, I'm so sorry, I can't speak tomorrow because I went out. Oh, wow, that's a drag. Man, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, that's going to be really weird for you to come and speak. Like no, you didn't hear me. I said, I'm not speaking. I'm not going to speak. I can't because there's a, a one-year requirement to speak at that meeting. You have to be sober a year, and I, I don't meet the... Yeah, I said, no, you, some people are going to be really pissed. I'll see you there tomorrow, Friday. <laughs> It was the greatest gift anybody had given me sobriety. People were upset. People came to thank me afterwards. Yeah, that was great. You know, you should have a little more time than 24 hours, by the way. People were angry. It was per I didn't dip my toe in the program anymore. I dove in, was pushed by Bobby, and I've been here ever since. And I got a sponsor, and I worked the steps. And I didn't fool around with this. And that's what we all have to do, and that's why we're sober those of us who are sober a while and that's what these newcomers taking their chips and the people taking cakes uh ellery and everybody god bless you all and michelle thank you so much for having me thank you <laughs>